Good morning, friends, and welcome to the Oak Arbor Church. It's wonderful to be here. It's always wonderful to worship in this sanctuary and to be together with you all uh, and with everybody who's also joining us online, either now or a little later. Uh, I wanted to begin with a quick announcement about uh, two weeks from now, we're going to begin a journey program or a spiritual growth, uh, spiritual growth program that you're all invited to uh, participate in. This year, we're using a program uh, called Rise Above It, which is one that you may have done many years ago, but there's also a newer version of this, uh, which is also quite interesting, that is specifically for college students and young adults. Uh, and so the examples in that one are actually much more applicable to our younger people's minds, whereas the regular one may be one that you would like to use if you are, are more advanced in those years or perhaps uh, would like to use that one. Uh, this program walks through the Ten Commandments as a means of spiritual development and looks at it how it is our basis to grow and to change and to become good heavenly people. So two weeks from now we'll begin that program and uh, there are a few books here and we'd also be, would be interested uh, if you are wanting us to order for you. All right, so more on that at a later date. This morning, we are looking at the topic of art and creativity. A lot of the times with church and religion, we get very much caught in the theology and the thinking sides of things. Today, I want to kind of drop into the feeling side of things. What, what is this artistic ability that human beings have? Where does it come from? And is it useful? So how about we begin our service by rising? We'll open the Lord's word and sing a hymn. Uh, number 865. Please rise. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all of his works. Amen. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you, humbly asking that you may enlighten our minds and lift our hearts up that we may wish to do good in your name and for your sake, so that all of those that are around us may see the beauty of your creation and the wonders of your love. Please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
as in the heavens, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Amen. And please rise. going to read our first lesson together, which is also our recitation, which is number 412 in our liturgies. And this is the very first three verses of the Lord's Word, or the Holy Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the faces of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Amen. Please be seated. And I'll be inviting the children up to take a look at things in a couple of minutes, you, or you're welcome to come up now, actually, if you'd like. Yeah, it doesn't make much difference. You can come on up if you'd like. We're going to go ahead and have a seat. First wanted to mention that though we're talking about creativity and art and things like that, does anybody in this room feel like, well, I'm not much of an artist, don't really care too much to be creative, that's not really my thing. Do you guys like to draw and paint and to sculpt things and to make things? You're, you guys like creativity. Some people, that's not what their game is all about. Some people like rigid math. They want things to work out perfectly and have... It's actually pretty artistic too, even if we're talking about very strict numbers. Artistic ability and creativity are things that all of us have even if some of us focus more on the artsy fun side and some of us might focus more on the very strict make sure everything fits into its pattern side. So we're talking about art and creativity and how it relates to our spiritual growth. What is spiritual growth in the first place? Do you guys grow physically? How tall are you now? Do you think you'll be taller tomorrow? Just maybe a teeny, teeny bit. We all grow just a teeny, teeny bit of every day until we stop growing, right? And then as adults, we stay about the same height for a while, and then we might start shrinking at the end, just little teeny bits. What is spiritual growth? We physically can grow up taller or maybe out wider. Spiritual growth is when our minds are filled with more true ideas and our hearts are filled with more love. So how can art help us to grow spiritually, to give us new true ideas and good loves to express? So this morning, we all read the very first three verses of the Lord's Word. And it begins by saying that God created, what did he create first? The heavens and the earth, right? And it says that the earth was void. It was empty. And there was darkness over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. Now, it says that the earth was void. It was without form. Does this just look like a chunk of dirt? Kind of like a chunk of dirt, right? This is just a bunch of clay. What could we do with a bunch of clay? What types of things can we do with clay? I'm going to let you guys hold on to this. I'm going to go ahead and give you each a little piece so you can each think about how does this stuff work? just play around with that clay. What types of things could we make with clay? 
Now, one thing we could do when we think about the very beginning of creation, it says that the earth was without form and it was void. It's just kind of a blob of earth. And then God comes along and seems like he wants to do something with that blob of earth. And it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And he saw that it was good. Hmm. So we might have a piece of clay. Do you know what you're going to make with your piece of clay? You're just going to make little balls with it? That's cool. You can come on up. Would you like to share a little bit of clay with Asher? So, we might stare at a piece of clay and go, what do I want to build with it? And come up with no ideas, just racking our brains, ugh, I don't know what to make. You're going to make a pancake. That's a nice, easy thing to make sometimes. That's pretty hard clay, isn't it? It doesn't break. You know what? I bet you it gets easier and easier the more the warmth of your hands touch it. Doesn't that get nice and easier to work with? We can be completely empty of ideas of what to do with the clay. So we might imagine the Lord sitting over this, going, hmm, what should I do with this universe that I'm about to create? He's got a blob of stuff. It was the earth without form and void. How do we get out of mental blocks when we're being artistic? When we're trying to figure out, what am I going to paint? Like, for instance, this is a painting that I started. And I had a piece of paper that was blank. What do I have in there? There's some trees and some, yeah. There's a house in there. There's a sky. Why did I paint those things? I had a completely empty blank. I could have done anything. I could have painted anything I wanted, and I chose to paint those things. Did you know that this is actually what the backyard of my house looks like? So I stared out the window when it was nice and cold and wintry and snowy, and I went, what would that look like if it was all filled with flowers? So I could take an idea and put it onto paper. Now, Sadly, I got to a point on this painting where I was getting so mad at this tree. It just wouldn't come out right, and I'm still not happy. I look at it and I go, that blemish, that terrible thing in the middle of my painting, it just doesn't, see, all the other stuff looks pretty good, but I got it in here, and it's just messy. It kind of looks like the yellow. Yeah, that yellow, it doesn't work. <sighs> you know, that do, those are pine cones. Hmm. Where do our ideas come from? Where do ideas that become things come from? And it starts off where the Lord says that it was void. The earth was just a mass of stuff. And yet there was a hovering over it. Now this, guys, looks like just a mass of stuff, right? Well, we're going to find out. There's actually something hidden inside of here. Wait, what? What? Because there's some different things that we can do with clay. So I was going to share some of this artistically. So we've got a nice, ooh, look at this. What, what is the message that we found inside of that? I love you. Oh, isn't that nice? Well, here's what's interesting. We know that when the Lord created the world, that what he had is the only thing that he could make things from. And it's the same with us. If we don't have something to make something from, then we can't make anything. Like if I took your clay away, just one of you. Now, please make me a clay instrument. But you didn't have any clay, so you could get it from a friend or you could have your clay back. There you go. We have to have the things we create from, right? So what can the Lord create things from? Well, we're told that the Lord is love itself. Now, this is our nice blue, because it was the, the Spirit of God hovering above the waters. But it's the Lord's love 
that is inside of all of creation. The Lord created things from his love, and then by means of his wisdom, he makes it lots of little individual things that mean the same. What's up? There's Hebrew on the back. It's close to Hebrew. This is even before Hebrew in some ways. It's a, it's a type of thing called cuneiform. So, early on, when people just had clay, before they made lots of pieces of art, they figured out they could tell each other things when they weren't even present with each other. Like, if I needed to warn you, don't go in this cave because there's a big lion in there. I might leave a little note outside of that cave that says, lion. Right? And I can carve that and leave it outside of something to leave a message for other people. I don't even have to be present, right? Now, I would want this message to be truthful, right? So if there was a big hole in the ground and people would fall down in it and I covered it up with leaves and then I put a message on it that says, step here. That would, that would no. It's pretty artistic though. I'm still using clay and letters, right? So it's not just, it's not just what we can do. It might have something to do with how we do and why we do things. So the Lord's Word is full of lots of wonderful images, and we're going to read a little bit about the making of the tabernacle. Can I actually have some clay back? And we're going to listen to a story from the Word. We're going to take all of it back, just to keep us from being too distracted. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take that back. All right. So, let's le read a little bit from the Lord's Word. This is a story where the Lord calls specific artists to help construct the temple or the tabernacle of meeting. So, what happens is the Lord says to Moses, we need to build a place for worship. A tent of meeting is what it was called, a tabernacle. And he told Moses that the place that we're going to get all of the stuff that we'll need, all of the materials, whether that, you know, comes from the Lord's love or from the things that we have, we have paper, for instance, or clay, that the people would bring all of the materials and that the Lord would raise a specific artist up to organize all of the materials and then make it into a beautiful house to glorify the Lord. So in chapter 25 of Exodus it reads, So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they may bring me an offering. From everyone who gives it freely, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them. Gold and silver and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet threads, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skin dyed in red, badger skin, and acacia wood. Oil for the lights and spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod in the breastplate. And let them... Make me a sanctuary that I might live with them or dwell among them. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all of its furnishings, just so you shall make it. So the Lord says, I will show you how to build the tabernacle. You bring all of the materials that we'll need, and then I'll help you. Then I'll give you specific instructions to do it exactly right. A little bit later on, we're told exactly who it was that the children of Israel were going to follow, the main artists and craftsmen. And we're going to read a little bit about that. It says, Moses said to the children of Israel, 
See, the Lord has called by name Basilel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, from the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom and understanding, in knowledge and in all manner of worksmanship. To design artistic works, let's keep our hands to ourselves, please. To design artistic works to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels, for setting into carving wood, and to work in all manner of artistic workmanship. He has put in his heart the ability to teach to him and to Aholiab, the son of, um, the son of Ahismach, of the tribe of Dan. So the Lord asked the children of Israel to bring all of the different materials that they would need to build the temple. And do you think the children of Israel brought it? They did. It says every single morning the children of Israel would bring their offerings willingly to the Lord that they would bring gold and silver and bronze and all types of gemstones, lots of different things. And then it says that a person named Bezalel, he was going to be the chief artist. You guys want to know an interesting artistic secret about the Lord's word? Bezalel's name means under the shadow of God. Do you guys remember in the very beginning what it says about the earth being darkness? Isn't the shadow kind of like darkness? And that the Spirit of God was hovering above the waters? Basilel kind of represents that part of us that is going, I'm not quite sure what to do, but the Lord knows. And it's just a willingness to follow the Lord even though it's kind of a dark, mysterious, obscure way to think about life, when we don't know what to do, we can trust that the Lord will show us. We have a few more things that I want to talk about this morning. One of them is about the different kinds of materials we can use to make art. So we talked about clay, right? What kinds of things can we make with clay? can make a really cool design if you're really skilled. Yeah, Alexa? So you can make swirlies and cool designs on a, like you can use this and maybe write flat things on it. Yeah, yep, that would be cool. You want to see, we have something beautiful that's made out of clay right here. I want to show you. Look at how beautiful this is. Isn't that nice? Now, what would make this not work very well? Um, yeah? If you just put a pieces of clay together, it would make this, like, smush them together. If you just smushed them together, it probably wouldn't work, don't you? It might fall apart, don't you think? Maybe. What would be a big problem if this maybe had a hole in the bottom of it? It wouldn't work very well, would it? So somebody with a lot of skill and a lot of practice and time learned how to make clay into this wonderful, beautiful circle. And we can see all of the little things in there. And the backside is a little different. And we can see how different that is. That looks a little purplish. Purpley and shiny. And then they put it into a fire. And then it, have you guys seen it? Pottery needs to be put into a fire, and then it burns, it, and then it stays completely solid. And then we can no longer bend it up like this, right? Old bendy clay, you can just make whatever you want. Can you bend that? Not anymore. Okay, we're going to put this away. What other things can we use to make art?
Mm -hmm. She says that in Ghana, they have a welder that can put things together. Is this kind of like, isn't that metal? So that's what you're talking about. This is a nice, beautiful metal butterfly. And it's kind of cool because it's not n just normal. It's got these, these holes in the edge that make it just pretty, doesn't it? It's like a rainbow pattern. It changes colors when you... Oh, gave her a pottery wheel. That's a wonderful gift. And then we also have paper, right? Paper is a material we need. And what did we put on, those pa on the paper? What is that? It's drawings, right? We need something to make those marks. Yeah? We could glue stuff on it. We can use bricks to build things. That's very artistic. To make sculptures. We can use different kinds of paint. This is a watercolor, which is different from oil paint, which is different from acrylics. Anybody who's worked with those three different paints know they do not operate in the same way. You can't use the same techniques, can you? A question I would want to ask all of us is, what's one more material that the Lord uses for his most important artwork? What do you think? Yeah. He might use gold. Yeah. Love, oh, that's, that's, the, that's definitely the right answer, is love. He uses us. We are just like the clay. Yeah? In fact, the Lord tells us this. You want to hear? Yeah. In Isaiah, the Lord says this. We're going to hear from Isaiah what the Lord says about this. He says... But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father, and we are the clay. You are the potter. Huh. You are the potter, and we are the clay, and all we are the work of your hands. So, you know how we can take clay, and we can build it, and we can move it around and press it into different things, and we can go, ooh, I want to make this into a nice little bowl, right? And I work it and work it and work it and work it, and I've got a nice bowl there, right? That's going to fall apart. So just like we can do that, the Lord, sure, the Lord can shape us, and he is shaping us, especially while we're alive in this world. Hopefully we're still some very malleable material that the medium that the Lord is using is workable because there's nothing worse just so you know this is rock hard clay and until I really work it it was pretty hard to press wasn't it you want this one all right you can have that one and I'll give you that one I think we got one that one all right this is just too fun all right one more thing there we go so, our different mediums, including us, are things that are used to produce something. It always has a use, or else art is kind of just pointless, right? We might think something is beautiful, but unless it inspires some sense of peace, joy, or commiseration, some way to connect people together, some way to glorify God, to express some emotion. There are lots of different things that art is for. It is both expressive, it's something that we can work through our problems with, get it out onto paper, but it's also something that we can glorify God with and connect people together with. And this is really the point of artwork. You made a circle. Good job. All artwork, including ourselves, is for a purpose. I wanted to do a short reading from the book of Romans, which talks about us being this kind of artwork. And in some ways how if we're not really utilizing our materials, meaning the goodness and truth that's put in us, 
or if we really think about it from the essence of creation, the love that the Lord has put into each one of us is really what's supposed to shine through us to show that the Lord's artwork is beautiful. How can we demonstrate the beauty of the Lord's creation by being his works of art? In Romans chapter 1, Paul is speaking about not being ashamed of the teachings of Christ. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in righteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Now here's what brings us all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. For since creation... Since, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, and his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful but became futile in thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible person. How do we become good artists? We're going to let these children enjoy this, and we'll talk over here for a minute. How do we get good at art? Is it just something that we are born with or we're not? Some people are, seem to have some amazing artistic abilities, and some people not so much, and everywhere along the scale. We all have some ability. The question is not necessarily how good we are at it, though practice will make us better. In some ways, our artwork is more about, are we willing to express eternal truth, divine truth, even if it goes against our own? Hey, guys, I'm enjoying that. You guys are having fun, but we'll keep our mouths down. Thank you. All right. So, for instance, if I'm working on this painting and I get frustrated that this one bit is just not working out, and I just decide to give up, which I did last winter, was the last time I touched this painting. Because I was frustrated, I was mad that I couldn't get that to fix itself. And so I just gave up on the rest of it. I'm hoping that I'll get back to it. But in that passage, Paul says, you know, I'm not afraid of teaching what the Lord teaches. So maybe I don't quite have the ability yet Maybe I shouldn't give up in the middle of it because I'm afraid of, I'm just not going to get this, it's just going to be a waste of time. What am I doing this for anyways? I'm not a painter. Am I going to show this off and people are going, ooh, how great you are as a painter? Probably not. What's the point if we're just painting things? Maybe it's trying to process, how do we get to the root of where the Lord's love is in us? Maybe when I paint this, it's not about the painting itself, but about me learning something about my own fears. Maybe artistic expression isn't just about the final product, but also about the process. Okay, we're going to need a carpet cleaning up here, I think. How about we head back to our seats? I know, it's so fun. Can I have those back and we're going to head back to our seats, please, for the close? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And one more. Hi, thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. I will, I will save all of it. We will clean that up later. Thank you.
hoping this isn't getting too disjointed, but thinking about we have art materials, we have mediums that artwork comes through. And every medium has its own restrictions. It has its own techniques that work with it. So somebody who really knows how to work with clay is going to be much better at working with clay than somebody who doesn't know how to work with it because the techniques they've learned. Uh, the materials, you might know that if clay is getting really brittle, you need to add some water. You know, those types of techniques are important. We, as a medium for divine artwork, have restrictions. We have abilities. We have capabilities that are built into us. And the Lord actually even tells us, you know, when I'm making something out of you, and we imagine that we're making a nice big plate here, that we're being spun on his potter's wheel, and what if we, we want it a certain way, and somehow I want the Lord to confirm for me that it's okay when somebody does something wrong for me to slap them, because I can justify that when it's really frustrating to me. That person deserves it. They did something wrong. We might look at our material and go, I don't like that the Lord wants me to be forgiving here. I'd much rather smack them. We have restrictions of the material because once we start going against what the Lord makes us of, which is love and wisdom, and we go away from that love and wisdom, it's just like the material going beyond its ability, where clay might break and become brittle. If we go into something thinking, oh, how can I glorify myself? How can I make sure that I have the honor, the gain, the wealth, the position, whatever it is? Then it takes away that love that is supposed to be inside of us. The material that the Lord uses there uh, isn't present anymore if we're going outside of the Lord's commandments. In a way, What's beautiful about this, though, is that we have a lot of time in this world, hopefully, and as things go about, we, we probably make mistakes. We probably lie. We probably have taken the Lord's name in vain. We've probably had other gods or idols in different ways. And so as we're living, we might go, man, I would love if I could feel love and stay in this place of love, but my vessel just keeps on draining out. If there's a hole in the bottom of your vessel, it's just going to keep draining out. And the Lord amazingly can say, you know what, we can fix that. We can be reformed by the Lord. This is a really good way to think about the concept of repentance reformation and regeneration that the new church is all about, saying that as a person, we generally are just a mass of junk, just like that image of the earth that was void. It was empty. It was just this stuff, and the Spirit of God is hovering above the waters, meaning above the ideas that will lift us out of the mire of our world and say, you know what, those materials that we have in this world can still be used for good. Our ability to think up, how can I lie to get out of trouble? All of that manipulative ability is probably better directed in an artistic way to go, how do I fix things with that same capability? How do I care for what's true instead of what's false? So we repent, we think differently, and then the Lord reforms us. We talked about how clay is something that's put into the fire. That's what happens when we leave this world. That the vessel we have is then put into the fire, and it's made permanent what it was. Does that vessel still have use? Can it hold love and wisdom? Can it connect people together? We as divine forms of art, that's what we do. If 
we follow what the potter does with us, which what artistic medium will go against what its master says? Hmm? Once you know how to work clay, hopefully you'll just, the clay will just do what you want it to. Until I really understand the medium, though, I might make mistakes and break it and not use enough water or too much water. The Lord, though, is the potter here. How can he reform us from that love? A reading from Romans actually gets on to this, talking about the motives being what's important. The things that they didn't do that Paul was complaining about uh, in this story was that they didn't glorify God and they weren't, uh, they didn't have any understanding and they weren't praising God with what they were doing. So, these two things can be thought of as when we're stuck creatively. We might have materials in front of us. We might have a lot of practice with those materials. But when we're just going, man, what should I do? Where can I get the inspiration to do something more creative? We look at how can I glorify God with the things that I already have within me? That's a simple place to start. How can I glorify God with the things that are already within me? The problem that Paul was calling out that says that they professed to be wise, and in so doing, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. Interestingly, we have to practice, right? We aren't going to just be perfect human beings, beautiful, divine examples of what love is, that we're going to make mistakes. We're not going to understand exactly how these bodies function as beautiful instruments of the Lord's hands. But we can be reformed. We can be brought back into a state where we can be changed again by the Lord. The question is, is are we willing to learn when we make mistakes? That's the simple thing about art is can we go back, oh, I made a mistake. One of the great things about painting is you can paint over things. Isn't that nice? Most of the time you can paint over things. Um, I don't think I could ever do something like that. That's pretty cool. I don't know how that was done. I've never done metal work like that. How long would it take for me to learn something like that? I don't know. Will I ever do it if I don't have a passion for that kind of artwork? Probably not. If I do it, maybe once, and then I'll put it back down if I don't love it. There has to be something inside of us that then comes out. Creativity is really what the Lord is all about. That's how he began the universe, is by creating it. So our universe is very similar. The, the future of our life is created with the materials we have now. And it will lead to good ends if it is drawn from the Lord's love and wisdom, those essential materials that were there at the beginning of creation. This is what a lot of the concepts of what the Lord tells us in the heavenly doctrine leads us to is everything that is good and true, including our artistic abilities, come from his love and wisdom. And that's where we're going to close. And your pamphlet is Conjugal Love number, sorry, uh, True Christian Religion number 37. You're welcome to read along and to think about this as a part of how we are one of these created objects that the Lord made. And so it means that our material, our bodies, our spirits, our lives are created from this same love and wisdom. Now, since God is the very soul and prime substance and form, the essence of which is love and wisdom, and since it was from him that all things came that were made, it follows 
that he created the universe in all of its parts out of love by means of wisdom. And thus the divine love together with the divine wisdom is present in every single created object. Love, too, is not only the essence which forms everything, but it also unites and joins them, so keeping together what has been formed. What a beautiful way to summarize the Lord's creation of creative beings, that he creates in a way that the things that are created will create more to bring that creation together and glorify him. As we look forward to the coming weeks, and I know that some people say, I'm not much of the creative type. Maybe you're somebody who does lots of different types of artwork, but find some new artistic medium to play around with. What are the capabilities of that medium? What makes it easy to work with, hard to work with? And how might that apply to our own spiritual work? Is it easier to work with us when we're soft, gentle, generous, or when we're hard, exacting? Us as a material, wouldn't it be nicer for the Lord to work with something that's soft, gentle, and humble? Amen. All right. Please rise, and we're going to sing hymn number 891, Lord, Look Down from Heaven. bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, our creator and sustainer, you are the inspiration for everything that is good in our lives. You lead us in new directions out of the darkness and confusion, the lack of answers that we might have from ourselves, and you show us a new way. Lord, you ask for us to bring to you an offering. Of all of those who give of it freely, you shall take their offering. Help us to be generous in spirit, to offer to you without resistance and without fear the love and the wisdom that is within our hearts and minds, that it may glorify you and bring us together as one in your name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We'll now sing our closing hymn, number 847.